want to welcome everyone to this month's edition of NDSU Extension Agribusiness's uh, Ag Market Situation and Outlook webinar. Uh, this is actually the last one for the year. Uh, we'll follow the, the format we always do. Uh, but Brian, if you want to take questions after your presentation. Yep. Uh, so uh, Brian does have to, has another commitment after his presentation. So we'll have questions immediately following that. Otherwise, uh, save them to the end. Uh, you can, we prefer to use the Q&A tool, uh, but you can also use the chat tool to ask questions. And then we'll, we'll get to those uh, either immediately after Brian's talk or at the end of the, the webinar. So Brian, the floor is yours. All righty. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm snowed in here at Fargo. We've gotten quite a bit so far in the last 24 hours and supposed to get more in the next 36. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, today, uh, I'm kind of kind of putting two things together I want to talk about real quick. Uh, our newsletter um, is coming out and I have an article about cap rates and interest uh, interest rates that that's included in it um, should be coming out shortly uh, when we get it. And that newsletter will be the last issue of the year and there won't be another issue in January. So the first uh, the next issue is going to be uh, February 1. Uh, because of the holidays and everything. But first, I want to talk uh, uh, quickly about uh, what the Federal Reserve did. So we're going to kind of end the year on uh, interest rates and inflation and talk some about land values. But so this is the Federal Reserve's uh, action so far this year. And then they just took action yesterday uh, with a half a point um, increase, which was expected. Uh, but so far, so we started the year, it's pretty interesting. Started the year beginning of March 2022, the federal funds rate that's what FFR is, uh, was a, a quarter of a percent, 0.25. Inflation kept increasing. Uh, uh, it stayed persistent, not only persistent, but increasing. We started the year around 5%, 5 and 6% in the early months, all the way up to 8 and change. Uh, the Federal Reserve responded with these rate hikes that you see on your screen right now. Uh, quarter point in March, half a point in May, three quarter in June, July, September, and November. And then the most recent brings us from a quarter of a point to start the year to four and a half percent, which is the highest in 15 years. And so that was not unexpected. That's kind of what the market uh, projected was going to happen, but it did indeed happen. But I, I like to show this slide with this information um, because just to put it into perspective, yes, interest rates have increased. They've uh, been increasing. Uh, but the average federal funds rate after yesterday's increase uh, is four and a half percent. OK, the average going back to 1954 is 4.6 percent. So on the long run, long run time horizon, we're really right around average, actually. So that's that's I think I find that interesting because it's a perception thing, right? We've been if you look at this chart, uh, this is where it was starting in 09 you know, basically as close to zero as you can get. In some cases it was zero. Increased a little, if we recall, back in 18 to about two, almost 3%, and then back down after uh, uh, COVID lockdowns and that, that recession that, was, that occurred. But then since then, increasing back up. But again, it's a perception thing. You know, if the federal funds rate had been three or 4% just below average and was now 4.6, nobody would bat an eye. But since it, interest rates have been so low for so long, it feels like they're much higher than they are because decision-making has changed. I mean, because we've had a decade of low interest rates. So eventually people start making decisions as if this is the new normal and the way forward. Uh, but again, we have had much higher rates than this. So moving toward inflation real quick. Price increases, uh, and this is the report that just came out uh, this week also, uh, they were slightly lower than expected. Um, the market expected 7.3%, uh, and this is kind of one of those deals, kind of like the uh, crop market reports that Frame puts out. You got what the trade expects, and then you've got what the actual numbers turn out to be. Uh, in this case, the trade, so to speak, the market's expected 7.3% of 7.1%. So still uh, high inflation, relatively high. Uh, off the highs quite a bit, but it does appear to be slowing. And that's what folks were waiting on uh, seeing. We saw the numbers come down a bit in October uh, and then come now they've come down a bit in September. And what I, what I mean is inflation is still high, but the rate of increase has slowed. And a big reason has been energy uh, so far. 
And we've even seen decreases in things like used cars, uh, things like that have come down some, so that's softening some of it. Food, though, still remains high, food in general. There are food items that have gone way up, things like eggs and so forth, but then there's items like uh, beef, which actually has come down some. But food remains, remains still pretty high, over 10%. So the projections for uh, quarter four of 2022 and 2023, inflation continued to be above 8%. Well, it doesn't look like that's going to have happened. Uh, and then the thought is that it will be about 3.5% by 23. And then Central Florida's projection, which came out not terribly long ago, slow faster. Theirs is appearing to be more closer to what's happened uh, in quarter four. By the end of 23, inflation will be down to 2%. But this is due to actions by the Fed. The, the assumption being that they're going to continue to fight inflation all the way through uh, 2023 as well. So the next meet time the Fed meets is going to be in February. Um, they, they don't have to wait for a meeting to actually increase rates, but that's typically that's kind of traditionally what they've done and what this Federal Reserve appears to be doing. The current target rate is again four and a half percent. A lot of folks 73% of the market thinks it'll be about a quarter percent increase up to 4.75 and about 25% a quarter of people think it'll be another half a percentage point increase bringing it up to 5%. And I put this up there just to show what the Federal Board of Governors thinks the rate will be through 2023. And what this indicates is that the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors does not believe there's going to be a rate decrease in 2023. That the average rate most are thinking it's going to be around 5.3 percent uh, for most of next year um, they're not going to continue increasing at these three quarters of percentage points and what that does is it, it'll put interest rates around seven and a half percent or so seven seven and a half maybe as high as eight percent and just let them sit there and the thinking being that if they sit there that will be enough to slow the rate of inflation that they don't need to hike them the federal funds rate up to six, seven percent, pushing uh, com consumer rates up above ten. Uh, these these board of governors that you see represented by this dot grouping here are thinking five, five and a half percent, somewhere in that range is going to be enough. Just kind of hanging out there, keeping out interest rates elevated to slow things down uh, to to continue this steady decline in the rate of inflation down to the the rate that they hope to be, which is two percent. And then finally on this, what I wanted to uh, mention was land values. And I put this chart in the most recent newsletter that, that I wrote that's, that, again, is, will be coming out in the next week or a few days. And what it shows, and, and I find this concept interesting, if we go back to 1994, all right, you got the purple line, that's the cap rate, which is the rental rate on farmland divided by the market value. They call it a cap rate, we call it a cap rate, and it's expressed as a percentage. Then the black line is the 30-year mortgage rate, and then the gray line is the 10-year yield on T-bills, treasuries, 10-year notes. Typically, the, cap, the, the, the yield on treasuries, 10-year notes, is about 2% below that cap rate. And that, that relationship, this chart goes back to 94, but it holds back before that into the 80s pretty easily. Uh, and then the... Typically, the uh, uh, cap rate is above uh, the 30-year the mortgage rate as well, right? And, and it kind of makes sense because if you had to borrow money, because let me back up real quick. If I'm looking at farmland as an investment piece of property, a piece of investment property, if I'm borrowing money at 7% to get a rate of return of 4%, Yes, there's a little bit of an increase in, in the rate of return when you include equity accumulation, but it wouldn't make much sense for me to borrow money at a rate that's higher than the rate of return on the investment that I'm borrowing money to buy it on, right? I mean, that, no one would do that or wouldn't do that in, in, in most other uh, uh, arenas. But, and, and so that relationship holds. So you got this cap rate, 30-year mortgage rate. Sometimes they invert a little bit uh as that mortgage rate you know changes and, and changes faster than the cash rent does or the market value of farmland those mortgage rates are a little more volatile but typically it hangs out above it now we come here to the 
And, and then that relationship with treasuries, it being uh, a little bit higher. And part of the reason for that is if I was looking at it again, from an investment perspective, treasuries are very liquid. I can turn around and flip treasuries anytime I want to, any day I want to. Uh, so I can turn those into cash relatively quickly. So typically the rate of return on those is lower than farmland, which has a, a much uh, slower, it's less liquid. So the current 10 year T note was about is about three and a half percent, three point four. It was over four percent in November. The cap rate for farmland has been around, especially if you deduct for uh, property taxes, below three percent for about the last six seven years, um, and and up around three at best if you even if you don't deduct for taxes. So the last time the ten year yield and the mortgage rates were this high was about two thousand and eight. So you go back here to two thousand eight. See the mortgage rate is about right here, uh, right around that six, seven percent mark for the year. Treasuries, again, right around four percent, which is roughly where they are now. But you look at where this cap rate is. In fact, the right now, the yield on 10 year treasuries is higher than the cap rate on farmland by at least a half a percent. And the mortgage rate is more than double uh, what the cap rate on farmland is right now. And so the question is that that I was, you know, been thinking to myself is, will this relationship that's basically been the trend for 30, 35 years continue? Will it at least 30 to 35 years? I, I, that's how far I got the data back for this. Will it continue that relationship between the cost of borrowing, outside investments that are relatively safe, and in farmland? Now, I know that folks may say, well, it continues to appreciate in value, and that's also included in returns, and that's true. Um, but then basically what you're saying is the speculative aspect of farmland has to be extremely strong in order for any purchase to make any sense, that, you've, that the capital gain has to offset the fact that you're getting essentially half the uh, that, that the rental income generated is half of what it needs to be to be comparable to both the rate that you would have to borrow at and or other investments that are considered more liquid and steady such as such as treasuries and that is that is true in a lot of arenas whether it's residential house buying or other commercial real estate or farmland until it's not right if you're banking on a capital gain to be the difference between it being a positive investment or not. We've seen instances in history where, where that's true for a decade, 15, 20 years until it's not, and then and then they gets and then things tend to tend to fall apart. But just calculated real quick, rents would need to increase compared to what they were a year ago, about 66 to 75% in order to get the cap rate where it needs to be to maintain that relationship. So I guess the question is, how long do we think interest rates are going to stay up there? I showed some information on what kind of the Fed thinks that they're going to be there for at least another year or so. Uh, and then the other part is, will rents come up? Because last year we had increases in land prices, you know, in North Dakota, closer to 11, 12 percent on cropland, but rents only increased 3.1 percent. Are we going to see a big jump in rents? I don't think it'll be big enough to offset a lot of what I just showed. I do think it's going to be much higher, but I also think there's going to be a land price increase and how high those are relatively is, is really going to uh, really going to tell the tale and, and kind of see if that relationship uh, maintains itself. Oh uh, yeah. Great question. I, I actually, uh, this a question from uh, uh, the participants. Doesn't this sound very similar to the housing crisis of 08? Yes and no. And, and here's why. The housing crisis of 08 and the farmland crisis of the 80s was very similar because what you had happening was people were borrowing money at rates that were much higher than they could afford and using equity to essentially make the purchase. Paper equity, okay, if you want to think of it that way. So they were the house, the, the, the assumption was when somebody bought a house in 08, for those who don't recall or just a refresher, I would buy a house, for instance, that I couldn't afford the payment. So they would put interest rates extremely low, no interest maybe for the first five years. Then a ballooning payment would be added on to the end of it at, at a much higher rate because I didn't have 
uh, uh, any money down or anything like that. But if my house appreciated, say, 15, 20, 25 percent in the five years that it happened, I rolled that equity into the loan to put my 20 percent down and get a much more manageable uh, uh, fixed interest rate. That works until it doesn't. The minute that housing values stop increasing, all of a sudden I can't roll that loan and get a much lower rate and I can't afford the payment in year five that's ballooning to 13, 14, 15 percent. The same thing happened in farmland in the 80s, not with ballooning interest necessarily, but farmland prices were increasing 15, 10, 20 percent per year. And so on paper, if you allowed those farmland values, the equity to increase, I could then take that equity use it as collateral on my next farmland purchase, and then, and, then, and then away I go. That's all true until all of a sudden farmland prices go down by 15, 20, 30%, and all the equity I thought I had, I no longer have. It just got wiped away in one fell swoop. This case, we're seeing less of that equity type borrowing being used as collateral and more cash uh, and things like that lately, okay? But what 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 I'm saying, what I worry about, though, in this and the farmland values can still decline, because if I'm looking at it from a perspective of now, all of a sudden, it's prohibitively high priced for the amount of income that it generates. Interest rates are high. So anyone that would have to borrow some of the money is out of the market now and not going to auctions, not trying to purchase once the cash gets burnt through. Then you see farmland prices essentially dip or rents go up because the, the relationship is kind of kind of messed up. So it's different. It's similar, but it is but it's different because of how it's being financed. Uh, I answered that one. How far will rates fall in a year or two? And will this be a new normal interest rate? Well, here's the thing. When I showed those average time horizons on, on interest rates, uh, the average rate on commercial loans, just consumer loans, is around between seven and eight, right around 8%. So it's tough to call it a new normal. That was the normal before we went through 10 years of, of rates being pegged so low uh, that, that seven or 8% was actually, is actually average. So I do think that, that interest rates are going to stay much uh, considerably above five and 6% where they had well below that. I mean, a lot of us have mortgages that are below two and 3%, right? So I do think that that's going to happen, but uh, I, I think that they'll stay above five and 6% for, for a considerable amount of time. All right, last one, Carl. Sounds like land prices might decrease to, due to high interest rates. I, th I think so. I think it's going to be a combination of things. High interest rates are going to price people who had to borrow, who would have had to borrow and could have bid up, helped bid up the land price out of the market, those who are on the bubble. But I think the other thing that it does is it makes folks stop and think about, even if you can afford it, uh, interest has been an afterthought on any purchases for a long time. All of a sudden you get seven, eight, and nine percent. It's no longer an afterthought anymore. It's 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 a real cost. The cost of capital is actually um, considerable at that rate. And so, yes, it will. It, and I want to be careful. I don't want to say it's going to cut the legs off and all of a sudden we're going to see like the 80s, 20 and a 20% reduction in land prices and 30 the next year. It could be a deal where if they just stay flat for the next 10 years and rents continue to come up to match it. Okay. That that's, that's one of the ways. And, and I think that that's probably more likely the case simply because the way that the land was purchased with cash and everything else, these aren't people who are going to be upside down in loans. So they may not be able to afford to buy more and want to buy more, but they're not going to be under tremendous pressure to get rid of and unload the land they got. So that's why it's different. Okay. Thanks for the questions. Hopefully I answered them all. Uh, I know we um, covered some a lot conceptually, but I, I appreciate everybody logging in this year. I, I hope everybody has a great holiday. Uh, and I hope uh, you don't have too much to dig out of. I know I know I do uh, this evening. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Ryan. Frain, floor is yours. All right. Very good. Uh, so here's, uh, again, once again, here's my contact information. I'm Frain Olson. I'm the crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. I'm happy to be with you here this afternoon. Um, again, I hope everybody's safe and warm at home.
Um, I know we got some, as Brian said, some shoveling out to do later on today, but um, hopefully be able to share some information and, and answer some questions for you. So uh, I, I do want to start out with um, a, a, just a brief comment on the December WASD report. So again, just to remind everybody, the WASD is the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates. Um, it's the, the forecast that USDA make every month on total production and consumption not only for U.S. domestic, uh, uh, the major crops in the U.S., but also globally. Um, this month's report was actually exceptionally quiet. There really wasn't uh, uh, much new information. There were very few refinements or additions or changes. Um, I guess the most notable change, and the one I'm going to talk about and focus on a little bit now today, was a reduction or a cut uh, in the forecast for total corn exports. So USDA did cut total corn exports, their estimate, by about 75 million bushels. So we went from about 2.1 billion uh, to just under 2.1 billion uh, in December. So again, it wasn't a major shift, a major reduction, but it was something that I think caught everybody's eye. Um, all of the other numbers when it came to uh, production and use of soybeans, production and use of wheat, uh, it, when we look at what's going on in South America, basically their expectation for uh, soybean production was unchanged in Brazil. The expectation for uh, a soybean production out of Argentina was unchanged. Now, I do expect as we move forward, because of some of the weather challenges, uh, some of the slower planting progress, some, some concerns and reports coming out of Argentina, that because of the extreme drought that's going on there, um, yield expectations and, and potentially planted acres are dropping. So I do expect that we're going to see some downward revision or adjustment in Argentina's production numbers for both corn and soybeans as we move forward into the new year. Um, the Brazilian production numbers, again, for both corn and soybeans, we're watching soybeans probably the closest because it's a larger number. Um, I, I think it'll take a little bit more time to see if there's going to be any major adjustments or changes. So what I'd really like to kind of take a take a step back and think about or talk about is our current export pace for corn, soybeans, and wheat, and and in particular for corn, because if we look at the the for the last several years, kind of who has been buying corn from the United States, how much have they been buying? I tried to break this table and in, down into kind of two different quadrants, and I'll explain it for corn. When I repeat this for for soybeans and wheat, you'll have a general understanding. So the first four columns on the far left-hand side are yearly totals. So that would be the marketing year totals for these different crop marketing years. And just as a reminder for everybody, the marketing year for corn and soybeans start on September 1. So it's just, just before harvest. And we think about, okay, how much inventory do we have bringing in from last year? How much are we going to produce? We add in some import importation to be able to get the total supply. And then we start subtracting out our usage. And again, usage for most of the crops it spans the calendar year. That's why when we look at 2021, 22, that would represent the crop that was harvested in 2021 and was being sold and marketed in 21 as well as into 2022. So that was last year's crop. So these are the totals for the 12 month period. And again, just to remind everybody, this is for corn. Mexico is typically our number one um, export destinations. So all of the countries that are listed are ranked based off of last year's totals. So notice last year, Mexico was our number one customer, China was number two, Japan number three, et cetera. So I listed basically the top five or six countries for each of the major commodities. Now, going back two years, notice as we came out of the, of the trade war, as we started looking at an expansion of, of, of exports into China, China came in and bought a lot more corn than we had originally expected. Um, last year, that number was down. Okay, so when we look at the grand totals, this total in 2020, 21, that marketing year, that was our record high. That's the high watermark. So last year, USDA was forecasting a slight decrease in our total export pace. A lot of that was because they didn't anticipate that China or expect that China would come in and be as aggressive of buyers as they as they had been the previous year. So now let's look at the two columns on the far right hand side. So these would be the total uh, export commitments. So these would be the contracts for delivery into the global market. These are the announced sales 
that we've had. They may not have been delivered yet, but these are sales that have been announced running from September 1 through these dates. So this is last year's total, September 1 through uh, December 9th. And this was the information we got this morning on the far right-hand side. So now let's compare the export pace to this year versus the export pace we had last year at the same time. So this column right here is the grand total for the entire 12 month period. And this is just from September 1 through this first week in December. So, so very quickly, let's start talking about, well, what are the changes? Do we see any major adjustments? Well, our friends from Mexico have been buying a little bit slower pace than last year, but we did get an announcement this morning after these totals were prepared that Mexico did come in and buy about another 100 million metric tons. So we could add about 100 on top of this, so about 6.5 billion uh, million metric ton versus 6.8 last year. Let's move to China. Again, last year, China was still a pretty good uh, customer of ours. But when you look, it was a lot of that was front loaded, meaning that they came in early after our harvest was completed and started buying a lot of US corn. Well, when we compare the last year's number at this time versus this year's number at this time, again, I'm a dramatic drop off. So a lot of the change, a lot of this reduction in our current export pace is because China has not stepped in and bought U.S. corn, at least they, not to the levels that they had previously. Now, one on the sidebar, and just a sidebar comment that I want everybody to be aware of, there was recently a change in the trade relations between Brazil and China that will allow Chinese companies, as well as Chinese governments, the government buying agencies, to be able to purchase Brazilian corn under uh, less restrictions. So there were some pretty stiff restrictions that China had on the traceability of the corn that was being exported from Brazil into China and their certification process within Brazil. Now, some of those rules and regulations have been relaxed, making it easier for China, the Chinese government buying agencies, as well as private companies, to be able to purchase corn from, from Brazil. So Brazil is the second largest export of corn right behind the United States. U.S. is still by far number one, but Brazil is number two when it comes to export volumes. So the big question people have is with this drop off in Chinese buying of U.S. corn, how much of that is traced back to just the, the, that they may need less corn? They may be buying a total lower amount of, of corn off the global market versus the expectation they're going to be buying from Brazil rather than buying from the US. It's still a little bit early to tell which of those is going to be the dominant play. I suspect there's going to be some of both. Um, so as we move forward, we're going to have to be watching and looking for, are, will there be continued purchases by China of US corn? Because right now that export pace is well behind what we saw um, last year, which again was lower than the year before. Japan, very steady customer. Again, they are down the pace, the rate at which they're buying is down from last year. Um, in the case of Japan, I do think some of that is because of some of the logistical problems we had on the lower Mississippi River. That some of that that the that the the Louisiana Gulf ports end up shipping a lot of corn into that Japanese market. I do think the fact that they had some some problems with barge traffic and the low water levels have slowed some of those purchases and deliveries that made U.S. corn a little bit more expensive than the Japanese were willing to pay. I do think they recognize that this is a timing issue. So in my personal opinion, I do think the Japanese will come in later, probably after the first of the year, and start buying some more U.S. corn and will likely catch up to the pace that they have had over the last couple of years. Because when you look at the annual totals, um, they have been a pretty nice, steady customer for us. Now we get into some of the smaller countries as far as purchasing volume, Colombia, Canada. Canada is well behind the pace that they had last year. Korea is, is probably pretty similar. So when we drop down to the bottom line, this is the big concern we have. When we look at how much corn we have sold at this time last year versus the numbers we're seeing right now, we're, below, we're, we're more than 50% less. And yes, a lot of that can be traced back to 
this drop off in Chinese buying, but not all of it. Only about half of that difference can be traced back to the Chinese market. The other half is everybody else. So yes, China's not buying like they did. They weren't as aggressive this year as they were last year. That is a large portion of that that helps tell the story. But we also have to realize that a lot of the other countries that typically would be buying from the U.S. at this time are very slow in their purchases. And again, I'm not 100% sure how much we can blame on the, the, the movement of grain through the Mississippi River levels and the fact that corn prices are high versus just corn prices are high enough that this starts starting to ration use. So one of the, this is one of my big takeaways from, from today's session is we have to be watching corn exports very, very closely as we move into the 2023 calendar year. And in order for us to maintain the kind of price levels we're seeing domestically here in the United States for corn, in particular in the futures markets, but also then for cash levels and basis levels, these export sales numbers are going to be, become more and more important as we move through the rest of this calendar year or rest of, excuse me, the rest of this marketing year. Shifting to soybeans, slightly different story on soybeans. We've actually had a pretty good export pace so far this year. So again, same thing. The columns on the, the four columns on the left-hand side are the annual totals. The two columns on the far right-hand side are from September 1 through this first week in December. So when we compare last year's export pace, versus this year's export pace at the same time, we're actually a little ahead of where we were last year. And, and a big chunk of that is because of some increased sales into that Chinese market. Now, again, we want when we look back at 2018, 2019, those two marketing years were heavily impacted by the trade war. So we really can't look at, at use those as a good reference point. But when we look at these numbers from, from the 2020, as well as 21, marketing years at about 35 million metric ton and 30 million metric ton. This 35 million metric ton was near record export pace. So this 30 million metric ton that we saw last year, when we look over kind of a long-term history is actually pretty close to what China has been buying historically. So if we look at what's going on in the last several months, the Chinese have come in and been relatively heavy buyers of US soybeans. I, but again, I want to caution everybody, once that Brazilian crop starts harvesting, once they start harvesting in northern Brazil, some of this export pace, the rate at which we're selling soybeans, especially to China, is going to start to slow down and taper, taper off. Also, I, just as a reminder, the, uh, the Brazilians started planting very early this year. They had kind of a dry spring. They were able to get in the field very early. They had some very rapid planting par progress, so they got the seed in the ground really quickly. Um, that's putting some really big expectations on yield and yield potential. Um, however, that also means that if they have a typical growing season, they're also going to be able to start harvest earlier. So rather than looking at a Brazilian harvest that's maybe first part of first part to mid-February is kind of hitting into the, the real peak or gut of their harvest. We're really looking, in my opinion, at probably mid-January to late January as when the, the harvest progress in Brazil is going to really pick up and start gaining speed. So the moral of the story is, yes, we've got some really good export pace right now. China's coming to, to the U.S. to buy their soybeans. But I think a lot of people in the marketplace are talking about by the time we get to mid-January, maybe later January, we're going to start to see that export buying shift from the U.S., and get into the Brazilian crop. So our export window, the, the window of opportunity we have this year might be a little bit shorter and tighter than what, we, what we've seen in the past. Our number two buyer of US soybeans has been Mexico. Um, and again, when you look at the pace that they brought last year versus the pace they're at this year, we're getting some really good soybean sales into the Mexican market. Uh, let's kind of, kind of cross our fingers and hope that that maintains and that stays. Because if so, that would be a new record export levels of U.S. soybeans into the Mexican market. So that would be helpful. Um, the European Union has been a really sporadic buyer of U.S. soybeans. Um, if, they're, if they're low priced enough or cheap enough, they will buy U.S. soybeans and bring them into the European Union to be crushed and, and processed into to veg, um, soybean meal and vegetable oil. 
Uh, their pace is a little bit above what we saw last year, but again, relatively little or small levels at this point in time. So when we go into some of our other countries, you can notice that, that they're very similar pace. When we come down to the bottom line, our total export sales, when you add up all of the possible countries that have, have bought from us, even though it may not have been delivered yet, the purchases are ahead of the pace we had last year. And so what I'm really hoping is that this continues. Um, obviously, we'll have to wait to see how aggressively the Brazilian crop is marketed and how quickly our export sales drop off. So I think we do have a window where we're going to continue to have some good sales, but that window is closing relatively quickly. So again, watching very closely what's happening as we move forward. Shifting to wheat. Now, this is all wheat. This is all classes of wheat blended together. Um, would be hard red winter wheat, this hard red spring, the white wheat, the durum, the soft, uh, soft red wheat, all blended together. Um, Mexico has typically been our number one customer, followed pretty closely by the Philippines and Japan. Those are kind of the big three. When we look at um, all export sales for wheat, uh, those big three are ahead of where they were last year, which is good. That's something we'd like to see. However, recognizing that last year, our export sales for all wheat was relatively low. So we've been running in about 24 million metric ton range for the last several years as far as exports. Last year was a very disappointing year for us. And part of that was because we didn't have as big a spring wheat crop. We also had some lower um, um, winter wheat yields, which, which just we didn't have as many bushels to sell. Um, and so then again, because we don't have the bushels available, prices were a little bit higher. It was priced out of the global market. Somebody had to give up some of their purchasing. Um, so when we look at, at the big three, our major customers, they're a little bit ahead of pace. Unfortunately, when we come down here to the total, so far, our total wheat exports are a bit behind what we saw last year. And again, last year's number was a little bit disappointing. So with all of the, the uh, I guess, uncertainty going on right now with the Ukraine and Russia and the war that's going on, the ability of both Russia and Ukraine to be able to export their grain, as well as some production problems now um, coming out of Argentina because of the drought, their yield, their wheat yields keep um, keep ratcheting down just a little bit every time that there's a new report. Um, Australia had a very large crop, but they had a lot of rain during the harvest time period. So some of that wheat is going to be in feed quality, not necessarily a milling quality wheat. So I do think as we go into this 2021, I mean, excuse me, into the 2023 calendar year, as we move, roll the clock over and we move into the calendar year 23, um, I, I do think we're going to start to see some more wheat sales. I just hope that they are strong enough and aggressive enough to be able to make up some of the difference. So we have a little bit better export season in, in U.S. wheat. Getting to spring wheat only, the story is a little bit better for spring wheat. So if we isolate on just the spring wheat sales, uh, again, these are the totals for, for the 12 month period. Philippines, Japan, and Mexico are kind of the big three with the Philippines being by far our largest customer for US spring wheat. When we look at the totals last year, again, was a little bit disappointing for spring wheat sales, but also recognized that we also had a drought. So the available bushels were down. When we look at total export sales this time this year, this would be from June 1. Now, the calendar year, marketing year for wheat is a little bit different, starts on June 1. We're, we're a little bit ahead of the pace that we were at last year. Uh, when you look at the country by country breakdown, the Philippines are a little bit behind. Um, Japan is right on pace. Mexico is a little bit ahead. A lot of this it ends up to be these other miscellaneous countries that buy U.S. spring wheat. So we, we're starting to get a little bit more interest as we have our supply chain is, is refilling, as spring wheat prices start to come down a little bit, becomes a little more affordable in the global markets. Um, and then we start to see our export pace start to increase a bit. Now, this is still not a terribly aggressive pace. I just want to caution everybody. The other thing I want to remind you is that the, the Canadians also had a very good spring wheat crop. Um, their bushels were actually near normal when you look across the, the entire country. Their quality profile is in pretty good shape. So the Canadians are going to be major competitors for us again in the global spring wheat market. So there are available supplies. The question is, can we ship them out of the U.S. relative to Canada? 
So it's looking a little bit better for spring wheat, but again, recognizing last year was not a, a very impressive export season. A couple more comments, then I'm going to finish and I'll, I'll hand it off to, uh, to Tim Petrie. Um, Brian spent a little bit of time talking about rising interest rates. Um, what does that mean kind of globally? It's not only here in the U.S. that interest rates are going up, but also globally. I do want to caution everybody, just to remind you, is that as interest rates go up, that also increases the cost of carry, meaning the cost of holding grain in storage starts to go up because that interest, that opportunity cost for the interest keeps chugging along as well. One of the most common questions I'm getting from this discussion about interest rates is, so what does that mean for exchange rates? What does that mean for the value of the US dollar? And this is where I wanna throw one more caution in. The dollar index, this is the, a graphic of the dollar index. This is often quoted on the radio or it's, it's used in print as kind of a reference, a guideline for how is the US dollar doing relative to other currencies? Are we, are we high priced or are we, we normally priced? And this just shows historically going back into the 1990s what that index has done. My caution in doing this is yes, that number, that index does influence market psychology, but please understand it's an index. So it's how is the US dollar compared to a bundle of other currencies? So I'm gonna go back one slide. That bundle of other currencies are very, very heavily weighted towards the European countries. So the Euro is 57%, the British pound is about 12%, the Swedish Krona is about 4% and the Swiss franc is just under 4%. If you add all those up, about 77% of this index is made up of European currencies. So what happens in the Europe and the European economy relative to the United States has a really big impact on what this index does. My point, we don't sell a lot of agricultural products from the US into the European markets, okay? So when we think about exchange rates and what is, what is influencing the balance of trade or how easy is it for us to sell our US corn or US wheat into the global markets, we need to look at the major countries that are buying our products. So yes, the Japanese yen is part of that, co that complex. And yes, the Canadian dollar is part of that complex. But the Mexican peso is not the British. I mean, the the um, the Filipino uh, currency is not the Ch uh, Chinese yuan is not. Uh, we don't have anything that shows the relative uh, rate of, for example, the uh, the um, um, Argentine peso or the the um, Brazilian currency. So exchange rates are really from country to country. So I do want to caution you, yes, the exchange rates make a difference, but please don't get too wrapped up in the fact that, oh, our US dollar index is X, because that really isn't a very good indicator at, when it comes to agricultural trade. So with that, I will stop sharing. Um, I, I will try and save my questions to the very end and hand things over to Tim Petrie. Good afternoon, everybody. Great to be with you. Today, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the meat industry and particularly records, we've been setting records uh, in 2022, actually before that in some cases, but a lot of records this year. And so uh, that's gonna be the theme. So I'm just gonna start off with total meat and poultry production in the US. And uh, that purple arrow on the top is 2022. And so uh, we set a record all time meat production this year and also on an individual commodity basis, we set a record for beef and chicken in total. Uh, swine production was down a little bit, pork production, just a hair off a, a record that was set in 2020. So we're producing a lot of meat, the only exception. And that, by the way, that, that icon you see there that is a, is a broken record. On, and, uh, and so we'll see a lot of those icons in my presentation today. The, the down talking about lamb and veal also set a record, but it's on the opposite side. We had a record low lamb and veal production, but uh, about everything else. And of course, the total is what's important is, is at record level. So usually when I'm doing this presentation live, I ask the audience, uh, you have a, if you have a background in economics, what does record high uh, production mean in terms of prices. And usually I look out in the audience and see people showing thumbs down that usually record production would be 
mean lower prices. So let's jump ahead. And, you know, if we're talking about cattle or beef, then uh, competing meats are important or it depends on whichever one you're interested in compared to the others. But interestingly enough, even though we had record meat production this year and record uh, beef and chicken and total production, prices have also been relatively high, at, particularly on a weekly basis, not necessarily on an annual basis, but in the upper left-hand corner, uh, uh, hog prices were record high back in July on a weekly basis, off the pace a little bit from an annual basis, but they hit record high weekly level. Go over to lamb prices were record high a year ago. Uh, down in the lower left, broiler prices uh, reached record high for this summer and will likely for the year. And of course, even influenza had something to do with that, but we're still gonna have record chicken production this year in spite of avian influenza. And then on the bottom right-hand side, turkey prices have been a record high all year and we're just right before Thanksgiving. So uh, we've got record high prices for uh, a lot of commodities and record high production. And so in order to have these record high prices, of course, we have to make it up with demand. And so demand for meat has been very good and better than expected in many respects, uh, both the domestic demand and the export uh, demand is very important uh, to us as well. We are the largest exporter of uh, beef and, and turkey in, in the U.S. and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and second only to uh, on, 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 uh, on the chicken side to Brazil, and you know, I, I don't know if mentioned hogs or not, or swan, uh, pork, but highest there. So, export market is very, very important to us, and that's been very good as well. So, let's get into the individual uh, cattle market classes because we have not been at record high levels, and we were uh, affected uh, greatly by the drought the last couple of years. And so uh, we expected originally a year or two ago for beef production to be falling because we've decreased the cow herd four straight years. But with the drought, then we have slaughtered a lot more cows. Cow slaughter is up 12% this year. And actually fed steer slaughter has been down because we've got lower numbers, but because of fewer replacement heifers. In fact, on July 1st, we had the lowest number of replacement heifers on record going back to 93. So they're going into the feedlot. So heifer slaughter has been up about 5%. So that's what's given us the, uh, the, uh, the, the high record high beef production and has kind of put a limit on prices with the, the more that we're selling there. But anyway, start off with fed steers and a lot of very busy slide here. And so basically I'm just gonna forget about the last three years on the bottom and the red line there has been this year. And so uh, fed cattle have averaged $20, a hundred weight more than they did last year. And it moved up throughout the entire year. We're up to right up about one, just under 160 there uh, last week. And we're at the highest level that we were back in 2015. Recall that uh, 2014, was our record high for all market classes of cattle. So we're up to 2015. And so uh, looking ahead then, let's look at the futures market. Those uh, gold squares on the top are the 2023 live cattle futures. And so uh, uh, on the left-hand side, you see our last record, annual record high on fed steers was 153.84. That's the annual average for 2014. So uh, if you look at those six futures contracts for next year, uh, trading up there 155 to 160, I, I just uh, averaged them out before we came on the air here and they average out to 158.50. So the futures market is saying we'll have record fed cattle prices next year. USDA is a little bit more conservative, still saying we'll have a record next year at uh, the last WASDA report, USD's uh, forecast was 155.50, which would still be a record. 
And then uh, way up in the top on the left-hand side, there are the 2024 futures that are another $10 higher for 2024 starting out. And so looks like a continued record year there. Of course, that's uh, from a supply demand standpoint now and barring any uh, uncertain or unpredictable events that come along. When we go down to the feeder cattle, uh, we've had a good year on calves again. Here's the 550 to six weight calves in North Dakota, averaging $30 better than they did last year, the red line up there. But we're quite a ways off uh, the pace for record prices as of now, although we are in, <clears throat> enjoying cyclically higher prices. The average uh, North Dakota 550 to six weight steer calves in 2014 was $250. We're right at at 110 now and we're likely do uh, better next year. What's holding us back on the feeder cattle versus fed cattle, the, the record high fed cattle prices are obviously gonna be supportive. The two major things that affect uh, calf and feeder cattle prices are fed steer prices and corn prices. And, uh, and so fed cattle prices are gonna be at record levels, but unfortunately not as high annually as 2012, but corn on a weekly basis did uh, hit a record high earlier in the summer. And the uh, calendar year average uh, USDA, average USDA corn price in 2014 was $4 a bushel, and it's going to be $7 a bushel this year. So we've got $3 higher corn to deal with. Again, remember my old adage, change corn 10 cents a bushel, change calf prices a buck in the opposite direction. So we're further off from hitting uh, record highs in calf prices, although we do expect them to be cyclically higher. And just more on that in a minute, we'll hit to the heavier weight yearling cattle then and kind of the same story there. We've been $20 higher than last year on the red line. Again, they're closer to the feedlot and the, and the higher feed costs that they're experiencing. Uh, there's next year's futures up there, the, uh, the eight futures contracts trading up there to begin the year next year, 2023 at around 190 and getting up there closer to 210 by the end of the year. And, uh, and so uh, the 2014 record high average on these heavyweight yearlings was $208. The futures, those futures contracts average 195.75, about 196. So, you know, about a little over $10 under the, the, uh, the historic high back in 2014. But again, uh, the, the big thing here, we know we were likely have record high fed cattle prices of uh, what's corn going to be. And so uh, I'm glad you were listening to Frayne there and talking about the exports and so on of corn. But anyway, uh, that's the thing to watch for next year. But as of now, uh, given what the uh, 2023 corn futures looks like, it looks like we, although we'll be cyclically higher, we won't be quite at record levels on the uh, yearlings as well, or like we are on the fed cattle. So here's a little bit longer picture then. And uh, again, there's our record highs. This happens to be the blue line on the top then are the calf prices and the red line are the yearlings and the bottom lighter blue line are the fed steers. And uh, so we're predicting the next several years to be cyclically higher. The actual numbers are shown down in the bottom right hand side there. This year we'll average 200 on calves. Next year the prediction is 225. And then uh, on up in 2024, again, not at record levels, we'd have to get up to 250 there for a record. And, uh, and then on the yearlings, again, 175 this year, probably 195 next year. The futures are right there uh, right now. And then uh, again, higher in 2024. Now, uh, again, uh, probably by 2025, and corn is the big thing there, by 2025, not on here, we're likely to challenge those highs on the, on the record highs on the feeder cattle. But uh, you know, it, it basically depends on corn prices and then uh, any other uncertain factors that come along. But anyway, since the cow herd has went down four straight years and we still have 70% of the cow herd in drought, don't know what's gonna happen next year. It, when it starts raining and then we start 
keeping heifer calves back and sell a lot fewer cows, beef production is going to uh, drop sharply and, and that's going to certainly spark prices. So we know or we think that we are going to have record high calf and feeder cattle prices will in the next few years, probably or uh, probable by 2025, but it could even be earlier than that, depending on corn prices and so on. And, and we'll just have to wait and see. So with that, uh, wish you all happy holidays and, uh, and uh, hopefully this weather straightens around a little bit um, for, uh, for you. And let's go to uh, uh, stop sharing here and turn it over to Dave. Great, thanks, Tim. Uh, so I've been getting a lot of questions recently about uh, diesel prices specifically. And so I'm going to talk uh, with a little bit of support uh, about the diesel gasoline spread. So the observation has been made pretty regularly uh, by, by many is that diesel prices are high. Uh, and again, what prices aren't high? Uh, you know, we're experiencing uh, pretty good inflation, including in energy, uh, food, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of there. I think one of the things that or where it's coming from is that there, that the, the price is higher, significantly higher relative to gasoline. That is that spread is bigger. We might not use the word spread when we see it, but we typically have in our mind some, some common difference between gasoline and diesel prices. And when it's outside of that range, uh, might take notice. Uh, and then obviously going along with that, you know, why is this happening? And then for how long? Uh, so, what I have here is is a, a picture of uh, ga uh, gasoline prices, diesel prices, and then the difference. So the blue is ultra low sulfur diesel. Uh, this is all from EIA, so it's from the Midwest or or, or Pad Four. Uh, gasoline is that orange line, and the spread is in gray. And so we can see, you know, just looking at the 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 blue and the orange lines, you know, they they're all they move together mostly. Uh, differences at different times. And of course, if we look at this, this spread, that'll show us what those differences are. And so typically, and I'm, I always think that diesel is going to be more expensive than gasoline. Uh, that certainly isn't always the case, um, but it, it it's holds most times. And then if we look uh, to the far right, you know, into 2022, and especially in the last few months, we see that that spread uh, has, has gotten large. The, the difference between the price of diesel and gasoline has increased. Uh, to a level that we haven't seen in the last 15 years and actually longer than that. Um, one thing I'd bring up here is, you know, this, these are Midwest prices. These are somewhat indicative of what we might see in North Dakota. Uh, the spread is large in, in much of the country, but the behavior isn't exactly the same as, as it is here. Um, so why is this happening? There's a lot of, a lot of things that kind of feed into this. You know, to me, the biggest drivers are what's happening in Europe. So we have this, this, historic shock to European energy markets with the war in Ukraine. Uh, and there's just this high demand for energy imports uh, in Europe, uh, natural gas, uh, crude oil, uh, refined products and the like. So that's driving up prices everywhere. And then especially on the East Coast, uh, because they're competing oftentimes for that same uh, uh, Brent oil, uh, the other thing that's going on too, that's really kind of, you know, just the seasonal thing is it is winter. Uh, most of us can notice that looking out the window and uh, heating oil, which is essentially diesel fuel, a, a, a variation of diesel fuel is used uh, for a lot of uh, heating in the Northeast. And so it's in this period of high demand, uh, especially as things are cold and, and things will be cold. Uh, unfortunately, if you guys haven't heard when the, the, the snow stops falling, it's going to get bitterly cold. Uh, so that's really not going to help this situation either. Uh, another thing that feeds into this too is that the East Coast has little refining capacity. So they're really getting squeezed. You have a lot of folks in Europe bidding up prices. You have folks on the East Coast bidding up prices uh, for diesel specifically. And you have to sit back and realize that gasoline is a related product, but the markets are really different. So, you know, diesel fuel primarily is the fuel we use for freight, that we use for industry, that we use for agriculture, gasoline is for passenger travel. And, you know, the, the demand for gasoline really fell off 
uh, midsummer and remains weak and especially relatively weaker and significantly weaker than than diesel, relatively speaking. So in that difference in the high demand for diesel and the low demand for gas is really, uh, you know, driving what what you see. Uh, and just to kind of read that more. So just a quick review of petroleum refining. So you have a distillation column. You put a barrel of, of uh, crude oil in and you get a variety of products. And for the most part, the, the products that come out are dictated by the characteristics of the oil and the characteristics of the refinery. You can't shift uh, you know, tremendous amounts of material into diesel, even though that's the most highly valued at the time. There are some tools that you can use. There's some flexibility depending on the refineries outfitted, but for the most part, the hands are, are more or less tied in terms of the product that's coming out. And that is, is really important because you think that right now, you know, everybody wants more diesel, but as you have more diesel, you're bringing more gasoline to the market. So that drives the spread. You're increasing that supply of gasoline. It has to be sold as a, at a discount to clear the market. And that's why you're seeing the significant difference. One thing to always note, uh, and people always miss this, and it's not highly related to this, but local markets, local conditions are going to lead to differences in local prices. And you can see that from different parts of town or driving down the highway, you know, where the price from one community or one station to the next is different because of those dynamics. We're talking about what's happening more on the wholesale side that is pushed through to those local levels. And the question is, how long is this per going to persist? And so the first and, and best good news, especially for agriculture, is the, the, the high prices of diesel should uh, be relieved to some extent as spring approaches. Again, because this is being driven by winter. Uh, it's being driven by what's happening in Europe. And again, because they're experiencing winter, uh, by the time we get to March and April, we'll see a decline in prices. So I did have a... Uh, the numbers for the, the the New York Harbor futures for ultra low sulfur diesel is 30, 30 cents less than it is for the current spot. Um, so that's good news. Um, one of the issues that persists is you know, unless we you know enter a severe recession and we see a, a significant downturn in, in in freight movements, which I would find surprising. You know, a lot of this is still driven by some structural issues that aren't gonna be quickly addressed. I don't know what's gonna happen in Europe, but I really don't see anyone building a refinery uh, anywhere, uh, even though these economics would certainly support something like that if, it, if the conditions were to persist uh, and other factors wouldn't negatively impact that type of decision. Um, but again, just talk, talking to a farmer who might be worried about prices, um, there should be a little bit of relief come spring. Um, still going to be uh, at, at relative highs, just like much of energy is like a lot of other uh, prices are uh, in the current economy. So with that, that ends my part of the presentation. Uh, and we're going to open it up for questions. I do know that Frayne had one. Uh, so Frayne, if you want to go ahead and field that one, um, and I th there might be another. All right, let me get my camera clicked back on here. There we go. Um, so question that came in. So what is the status of the Trump China tariff situation? Um, so just to remind everybody, can during the there during the, the big trade war with the United States, uh, there was a series of import tariffs that the US put on, on Chinese products. Um, all of those tariffs are still in place. So the tariffs that President Trump put on on the importation of different uh basic uh uh inputs or basic products coming from China into the U.S. has all of those tariffs are still in place. Um, the Biden administration has put on additional restrictions. So the difference between a tariff is you're just trying to increase the base price, you, you know, the, the price that it, as it arrives, and then it's basically an import tax that's put on uh, before it enters the country. That's the tariff piece. Um, the Biden administration has actually put a ban on the importation or use of certain Chinese technological products. Um, there's some new um, uh, bans being put on, on chips, uh, computer chips that have been manufactured in China that, are, that uh, are, are going to be imported into the US. 
as well as the sale of U.S. Uh, computer chips going into the Chinese economy. So some of the, the the technology part of our trade between the U.S. and China is starting to get more much more complicated. Uh, but the original tariffs that were put on are still in place and they're still in play. Thanks, friend. And we're already over time, so I'm sure everybody's ready to go out and, and, and shovel um, since it's, it's been an hour. Um, are there any last questions? Feel free to use the Q&A tool or the chat feature. Does any, any of the presenters have any additional thoughts or questions for another presenter? Um, one, one thing I would want to mention, because it comes out occasionally, is that these, these high prices uh, in energy or in any case is because uh, industry is selfish, right? So the petroleum industry is selfish. Uh, and that's just a horrible way of putting it. Uh, they're they're working in their own interests, which is what they're supposed to be doing. They're actually required by law to do that. And they're they they're working no differently or harder than they did prior to these prices going up. It's just that market conditions have changed. You know, they're positioning themselves for it. Refining is is extremely profitable right now. Uh, it had it hasn't always been, and it probably won't be again in the future. And eventually we're going to have a lot of stranded assets. But, you know, when people say oh, the, the, those selfish folks are, are driving this, um, that's really a, a a poor understanding of economics or at least a poor way to communicate it. So we did have uh, a couple things come in. Uh, I don't know if you saw one question is for you, Dave. Yeah, so a question about an app for lower diesel prices. So I'm not familiar with that one. I'm familiar with others. Uh, oftentimes there are tools like that. Um, you know, I can't speak specifically to it. Uh, you might be able to save a nickel or two and your and, and probably the best way to put it is your mileage may vary. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do think it makes sense that it, you should take some time to look at these high prices as always uh, in your own self-interest as a farmer to look for ways that you can reduce costs. You know, you always want to minimize your costs relative to your, your production. So, um, you know, if that might work, great. Uh, if if you do investigate that and you see that it does, I, I'd love to hear more about it. And if there's no more questions, I want to thank everybody, wish everybody a happy holidays. Please be safe over the next couple of days. Uh, hopefully you did buy your presents before it gets cold next week and you have to pay the heating bill because it's going to be it's going to be a big one. Uh, but with that, thanks everybody for joining. Thanks, uh, Frayne and Tim for also presenting and we'll see you next year. Thanks. All right. Happy holidays. Mm -hmm.